2020. It's the year that played out like a script found in Rod Serling's basement. Every day had headlines that sounded more and more like the lyrics to Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire. Well, had the song been written by Stephen King. Australia was on fire while tensions grew between the United States and Iran. We had mass shootings in Aurora, Colorado and Texas. And a strange new virus beginning to spread through China. There was a tragic helicopter crash in Southern California that killed nine people, including Kobe Bryant and his daughter. We had the Super Bowl halftime show, which gave us more tits and ass than Pornhub. And then people mysteriously stuck around to watch The Masked Singer. I'll never understand the popularity of that show. And who could forget the U.S. Senate voting to acquit President Donald Trump of any and all wrongdoing? And all of that happened in the first 37 days of the year. Now, it really doesn't matter what race, religion, political affiliation, or gender you are. We can all pretty much agree that 2020 was the worst thing to happen to planet Earth since Paris Hilton's attempt at a music career. Now that was a global pandemic. And speaking of music, when looking back on any given year, about the worst I can usually say is how terrible the songs were. But this year? Can I honestly say that any song was worse than a highly contagious respiratory disease? Or the president suggesting drinking bleach to get rid of it? Or worse than protests and civil unrest that stem from decades of social inequality? I mean, if I'm really going to be serious here for a minute, uh, do I think that the music of 2020 was worse than wildfires, hurricanes, or the fact that a nearly 80-year-old man on the verge of dementia was actually the better choice for president? And yeah, I'm sure at this moment you're sitting there saying, well, of course not, Mike. There's not any music that's worse than the hellscape that's been 2020. Well, hang on just a second, because I'm serving up a rack of flaming hot filet feces that say otherwise. So sit back and get uncomfortable, because here it is. My list of the 20 worst songs of 2020. At number 20, it's Jordan Davis, Slow Dance in a Parking Lot. Lights go down, wheels go round, I'm taking you home. Hoping for a slow song to come on the radio now I'm not ready to shut it down the way the dashboard goes Sitting your eyes making me lose everything On my mind and the only thing I wanna do is find a spot Stop this car and throw it in park and just slow dance Wedding spinning around by the Walmart sign moving off the over the painted white lines Get close to you Making the most of whatever we got Even if it's just a slow dance in a parking lot All right, so ladies, just imagine for a moment you're on a date with a guy, he's driving you home, it's late at night, and suddenly he decides to pull over into a Walmart parking lot. He opens his door, and just about the time you think he's going to the trunk to get the axe so he can hack you into a million pieces, well, he does the next weirdest thing and asks you to dance. Aw, how totally romantic. Well, then again, it is country music, so I imagine after an intimate dinner sharing a Grand Slam at Denny's, you start driving her home, you put on the radio and wait for a slow song to come on, and when it does, you pull her on over into the Walmart parking lot, do a two-step, put your sausage in her griddle, make that third young and you have no intention of supporting, say I do, and get pronounced cousin and wife. It really is the great American love story. It's not even really a believable premise for a song anyway, as most guys don't like to dance. Well, unless, of course, they're drunk, or they're of a persuasion that generally isn't accepted by the culture of country music. Anyway, looking at the next verse, there's a line about a security guard flashing his lights, there's a random reference to Garth Brooks. Not really sure what that's about. I guess it's required in country music that you reference other country artists. And then we're right back to the hook. There is no bridge or extra verse in this song either. We just go right back to the hook one more time, and then that's it. It's your typical modern lazy songwriting at its finest. I think it's pretty safe to say this was not a banner year for country music. Number 19 is Halsey. You should be sad. I want to start this out and say, I got to get it off my chest. Got no anger, got no malice, just a little bit of regret. Oh, for fuck's sake, you're still talking about your breakup with G-Eazy? That happened over two and a half years ago. She claims that she has no anger and no malice, but here she is doing yet another song about this very topic. 
A song that, by the way, runs 3 minutes 25 seconds. And given the average length of a track these days is about two and a half minutes, you essentially wrote a prog rock opus to tell us what? That you just want to wish him the best? Yeah, I'm not buying it. I'm so glad I never ever had a baby with you. Cause you can love nothing unless there's something in it for you. Oh, I feel so sorry. I feel so sad. it still sounds like you're pretty pissed off with this guy. I feel so sorry. I feel so sad. Yeah, and then there's this verse. I see. So the guy was a train wreck when you met him. You tried to put him back together, and clearly it didn't work out. But you're mad at him? Isn't that kind of your fault? I mean, sure, he was a mess, but you decided to take on that project. And then, when it blew up in your face, you get upset at him for it? I really don't know what the fixation is with getting into a relationship with someone that's broken or a work in progress. I mean, if you want to do that, fine. But then don't get mad at that person when it turns out that they're just damaged beyond any hope of repair. Don't get mad at yourself either, really. Just take it as a life lesson, move on, and try to find something better. Oh yeah, and if you're a musician that finds themselves in this situation, nudge, nudge, well then maybe don't write a dozen songs about this topic, because people might start to think that you're a talentless hack. Number 18 is Car Seat Headrest, Hollywood. Everywhere I go, I'm oppressed by these energies. Like it, yes, I love it. I hear music in my head. Is that a good? Is something's going on. I can remember a time when alt-rock was my go-to genre for decent new music. But for several years now, the sound has just become so homogenous. One song bleeds into another, you can't really tell the difference, and the few songs that do seem to stand out usually do so for the wrong reasons. Case in point, this piece of crap. This track seems like they took the worst elements from Modest Mouse and Beck, combined it with the lead singer of Cake, and brought in the sound engineering team of Marley Matlin and Helen Keller. Actually, the band says that some of their biggest influences include The Beatles, Pink Floyd, Neil Diamond, The Cars, Queen, and Rod Stewart. Where the fuck do you hear any of those in this song? I don't ever remember Rick Ocasek screaming a bunch of gibberish in the background of You Might Think, or Rod Stewart doing some rambling monologue in Maggie May. And that brings about another question I have here. Why is this song speaking to me in a monotone and yelling at me at the same time? Anyway, the hook to this song is pretty simple. Lyrically and idealistically, this song is actually pretty solid. It's about the pressures of trying to make it in showbiz, which is a stress that can slowly drive you insane to the point of paranoia or even hallucination, and that the whole concept of Hollywood is so disgusting that it just makes you want to vomit. And while it's not totally relatable, the message is something that a lot of people could understand, maybe even agree with. It's just too bad that the execution was so sloppy. Now, to be fair, the radio version of this song is actually more enjoyable. About 90% less shouting, and the mix is much cleaner overall. When the radio version of a song is better than the original, you know there's a problem. At number 17, how about something completely different? I'm being somewhat serious. It's Blackpink and Selena Gomez, Ice Cream. Looks so good, yeah, looks so sweet. Hey. Looking good in that to eat. Close with the kiss, so we call me Ice Cream. Catch me in the Hey, what do you mean this doesn't sound like anything different? Come on, man, this is K-pop. You know, that genre of music I've been hearing about forever that's so incredibly popular, and it's revolutionizing the music industry. Well, let's see what we've got so far. 
a repetitive chorus with a weird backing track and nonsense lyrics that are sprinkled, <laughs> ice cream fun, see that, with double entendre. Actually, let's analyze these lyrics. She looks real sweet, good enough to eat, in fact. Mm-hmm. I guess her kisses are cold. And then this line, I don't get it all. Ice is found in the freezer, not the fridge. If your fridge has ice in it, then it's running too cold. Oh, I see. She has diamonds on her wrist, so she's ice cream. Got it. Maybe if we check out one of the verses, we can find something new and exciting. Chilling like a villain, yeah, rah, rah, rah. Mitchin, mitchin, the time struck to win my life, rah, rah. No more follow, none of bigger, one of damn it. Can you cheat them? Millies, millies, made butter. Han yo, them some more get autumn. Keep it moving like my Lisa. Think you fly, but where you be some Mona Lisa? Can a Lisa need some ice cream and a treat? See, Mike, there's Korean in this song. It's different. Yes, that's the best part, honestly. But then when you look at the rest of this verse, she wants his credit card and for him to be her ice cream man, meaning bring me more diamonds and material possessions. Basically, it's a song asking for a sugar daddy. I can see why people idolize K-pop so much now. We definitely don't have any songs about materialistic bullshit or exchanging money for sex in the U.S., Sorry, K-pop fans, but the only reason this song charted so high here in the U.S. is because it's riding on the coattails of Selena Gomez as the featured artist. Speaking of Selena Gomez, what does she contribute to this song? Come a little closer cause you look a thirsty. I'm gonna make it better, slip it like a slurpee. Ah, yes, heavily processed vocals and very odd note changes. That's her contribution. The one positive thing I will say about K-pop is that at least most of it seems to be happier and upbeat, which makes it far more pleasant to listen to than the overwhelming majority of North American pop tracks, which are musically minimalistic, slow, and depressing. And that's really the main reason this song isn't higher on my list. It's very saccharine, sure, it causes your teeth to hurt, but most American pop causes your ears to ring and your head to throb. So yeah, by comparison, I guess K-pop actually is better. Number 16 is Baby Keem, Orange Soda. Bitch sit on my face, I attack that. Choose up, Lil Jon, I'm finna pack him. When it comes to my bitch, I'm straight active. Dirt ball in the coupe, smoking cat piss. Lil bitch, shut the fuck up. Tell your best friend, shut the fuck up, ayy. Lil bitch, shut the fuck up. Tell your best friend, shut the fuck up. Okay, so new decade, new artist, but same old predictable genre with boilerplate lyrics. Here's what I'm going to do to you sexually. I believe the term choose up refers to a no strings attached relationship. No surprise there. Uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, I'm going to kick someone's ass. By the way, I have incredible sexual prowess. This line here about cat piss, well, for the boomers and Bible belters in the audience, this doesn't actually mean that he's going to ingest cat urine. Although I'm sure Donald Trump thinks that's a natural cure for COVID-19. It's just a potent strain of marijuana. Oh, and of course, there's the usual pejorative language toward women. Can't forget that. So in terms of efficiency, he nails it. That's packing a lot of tropes into an eight-line chorus. But don't you worry, because he's about to drop an epic verse on us. I can feel it. You know I love it when you talk dirty. Messy, you my orange soda shorty. You act like a little me, I want to She's his orange soda? Oh, right, orange crush. She's his crush, okay. Uh, even though he just got done telling us a minute ago that this was a no-strings-attached kind of deal and that she should shut the fuck up. Oh, baby Keem, you sweet talker. Anyway, I guess he's going to fuck her some more, buy her some stuff with all the money that he has, despite the fact that I've never heard of this guy before and have no idea where he's getting all of this money from in the first place. The only real notable thing about the song from this year was that some Twitter users were getting temporarily banned for quoting this line here. When you come see the crib, you better die, ho. I guess I could see why, without context, Twitter might have a problem with what could be construed as a death threat. Oh, and he also seems to have a problem with bitches that he can't impress. And who wouldn't be impressed with smoking cat piss and a kid that's bragging about his sexual proclivities? 
Number 15 is Lady Gaga and Ariana Grande, Rain On Me. actually kind of conflicted on this song. On one hand, I like the fact that it's upbeat, even though it sounds like it belongs in 1978. Unfortunately, the producers decided to do that annoying effect where you sample a word from the song and then use it as an instrument in the backing track throughout. The first time I listened to the lyrics for this song, I thought, ah, now this is the Gaga we all know. The weird, kinky chick that gives us highly suggestive, if not boldly obvious lyrics about what she wants. And then I saw the video, which features, among other things, Lady Gaga's face dripping wet. And I certainly didn't think this was a song about precipitation. Unless it's the type that comes from a passing golden shower or a downpour of baby batter all over her poker face. And you know, I was actually totally fine with that, even though some of the lyrics seem to contradict that theme. But as it turns out, this song is actually about trying to overcome addiction to alcohol. I'd rather be dry, but at least I'm alive suggests that she would rather be sober, but hey, at least she keeps on fighting. Boy, what a fun track to dance to at a club. Uh, assuming that we'll ever be allowed to go back to clubs again. So then, I guess this is a song discussing a very legitimate issue, and I should take it seriously. All right. Hands up to the sky. I'll be your galaxy. I'm about to fly. Rain on me, tsunami. Hands up to the sky. I'll be your galaxy. I'm about to fly. Rain, rain on me. All the Alkies, throw your hands up in the air like you just don't care. Oh, and tsunami as well, or something. Yeah, I don't get it. Number 14 is Louis Capaldi, Before You Go. So, before you go, was there something I could have said to make your heart beat better? If only I'd have known you had a storm to weather. So, before you Okay, you know what? I admit it. I was wrong, and I hereby apologize to Lady Gaga. I would much rather hear a depressing song set to an EDM or disco backing track than even 30 seconds of this. You know. So Louis Capaldi, the 24 going on 79 year old gravel throated hit making machine of the UK has another chart smasher. And if you thought this was a raspy downer of a dude with someone you loved, then feel free to reach for the Prozac after you check out this joyous ditty about overcoming the emotions of suicide. Look, I have no problem with a song that carries a serious or introspective message, regardless of whether it's fast, slow or otherwise. But Jesus Christ, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. The last thing I want to do when listening to music is hear some guy that sounds like he drank a grande razor blade frappuccino belting out some ballad about how he wishes he could have said something to prevent Auntie Carla from swallowing a bottle of Tylenol PM. At number 13, it's the Black Eyed Peas and J Balvin, Ritmo. This is the rhythm of the night. Baby, tonight's like fuego. Oh, we about to spin a dinero. Oh, Full disclosure here, I've never been a big fan of the Black Eyed Peas. I get why some people like them. They don't seem to take themselves too seriously. Their songs are actually rather upbeat and fun, albeit repetitive as can be. But it's those infectious hooks that made them famous. 
This track is just a low effort attempt at using nostalgia and Latin influence, which are two things rather big in pop music at present, in order to restart a group that hasn't really done much in 10 years. They use Rhythm of the Night by Corona. Yeah, I know, insert your own hack joke here, but it's a very slowed down sample. Kind of sad when a sample of a mediocre song from 25 years ago is the best thing about this tune. Despite the fact that this song has nine credited writers, the lyrics are about as empty as the toilet paper aisle at a grocery store. Let's see, we've got Baby Tonight's Like Fire, and we're gonna spend a lot of money. Oh, and we're also going to party to the extreme. These aren't so much song lyrics as they are the to-do list of every 19-year-old kid on any given Friday and Saturday night. And I'm not even sure what Tonight's Like Fire really means exactly other than to be destructive and menacing, which I guess sounds about right. Musically, this is about the weakest version of reggaeton you'll ever hear. A boring, predictable, unchanging beat throughout the song. I mean, just because you sampled a song from 1995 doesn't mean you had to use the same drum machine they had available back then. Hell, my Ensonic keyboard had better sounds than these. Latin music can be so interesting. But, as usual, the Black Eyed Peas don't have the creative capacity to expand much beyond... Baby, tonight's like fuego. Yeah, that. Number 12 is Thomas Rhett featuring John Party, Beer Can't Fix. You're all alone at a party, you wanna dance with somebody, but you ain't got a clue how to ask. You and your girl had a fight, and now she's saying goodbye. She ran upstairs and packed her bags. It could be raining on your perfect vacation. You could be stressed about your work situation. Listen to me, but all I'm saying Sounds like we've got the start of a country infomercial here. Hey, are y'all feeling alone in a crowd? Did your girl just up and leave for no good reason? Is it fixing a storm all over your vacation? Or maybe you stressed out at work? Well, shuckins, don't y'all worry none. Old Dr. Tommy Red here is just the cure for all your troubles. Ain't nothing that a beer can fix. Ain't no pain it can't wash away. That's right, it's the magical, mystical, and magnificent healing power of beer. Got a little social anxiety? Have a beer! In the middle of a domestic dispute? Beer! Hung over from drinking too much last night? Well then obviously you need a beer, my friend! Only in country music can you irresponsibly suggest that alcohol can fix your problems and somehow the song goes to number one on the Billboard Country Airplay chart. Oh, but we'll lose our collective shit over Baby It's Cold Outside because there's a line where it says that a woman is feeling tipsy because she had a drink. But a guy saying that there's nothing that a beer can't fix? Well, that's apparently just fine. And then later on, he says it might take one or it might take six. Now, just so no one is confused, I'm totally cool with beer. I put it in the same category as a substance like marijuana. Consume as much as you want, whatever you want, for whatever reason you desire. Just so long as you don't hurt anyone else, I couldn't care less. But it's just the hypocrisy of playing a song like this while censoring others that makes me want to pull my goddamn hair out. I mean, if I still had any, that is. And that brings about another point. If the title of this song was Ain't Nothing That A Joint Can't Fix, do you think that country radio stations would have played it? No way. Well, that's because Jesus drank alcohol. He didn't roll no doobie. Fucking morons. Ain't nothing that a beer can fix. Oh yeah? What about cirrhosis of the liver or fetal alcohol syndrome? At number 11, it's a tie. Well, kind of. It's between two versions of the song I Hope. There's the original recording by Gabby Barrett, and then there's the remix that features Charlie Puth. Each one has some issues, but let's start with the Gabby Barrett solo version. I I hope she makes you smile The way you made me smile On the other end of a phone In the middle of a highway Driving alone, oh baby I, I hope you hear a song Oh lovely, another song with snaps The box factory of production effects 
There are literally thousands of percussion elements that music producers could use, but why bother to use those? That's just space that you could fill with even more fucking snaps. Oh, man. All right. Anyway, I, uh, I feel better now. That makes you sing along and get you thinking about her. Then the last several miles turn into a blur, yeah. I hope you both feel sparks by the end of the drive. I hope you know she's the one by the end of the night. I hope you never, ever felt more free. Tell your friends that you're so happy. All right. So far, we've got a girl apparently wishing the best for a guy that's moved on from her. That seems like a nice sentiment. I mean, goddamn snapping aside, not really a terrible song so far, right? Well, this is a country song, so I think you know where this is going. I hope she comes along and wrecks every one of your plans. I hope we spend your last time to put a rock on her hand. I hope she's got to thank you while these dreams. She's everything you're ever gonna need. And then I hope she cheats like you did on me. And then I hope she cheats like you did on me. And there's your plot twist. The girl hopes that this asshole of a guy goes out, finds the girl of his dreams, knows that she's the one, and then just about the time he's totally in love with her, she decides to take the next train to New Sausage Town. That way he'll know exactly how it feels to get cheated on. Man, you know, this song sounds really familiar. Where the hell have I heard something similar to this before? Oh well. Anyway, the second verse has Gabby hoping that the new couple work things out, he forgives her for cheating on him, and then they fall in love all over again. And just as before, right about the time he's feeling his most secure, she hopes that this girl goes out and fucks someone else again just to make him feel even worse. By now, some of you have probably figured out why this song sounds so familiar. When I first heard Gabby Barrett, I thought it was a new Carrie Underwood track. And the similarities between the two are undeniable. Gabby not only sounds like Carrie Underwood, but you've got to admit, she's got quite a physical resemblance as well. Carrie Underwood's music career began after she won season four of American Idol, while Gabby took third place in Idol's 16th season, during which time she performed one of Carrie Underwood's songs for the Mother's Day special. And, of course, Carrie Underwood's signature hit is about getting revenge after a guy cheats on her, while Gabby Barrett's first major hit is about cheating as well, although hers isn't so much centered around destruction of property as it is just hoping for some twisted version of karma to come pay a visit to the cheating dickhead. And this is my biggest reason for putting this song on the list. By far, country music is the most stale, hollow genre in music over the past decade. It's not Gabby Barrett's fault, it's the powers that be in the country music industry. They just keep wheeling out the same tired male artists and giving us year after year of bro country. And the few females that they do allow to be showcased have to follow the same template of the 90s or 2000s acts like Shania Twain and Carrie Underwood. And so it's this bland, underwhelming crap that keeps managing to get on the charts. And it's not anything against Gabby Barrett, she seems reasonably talented, she can probably sing. But this song is just the kind of cliched trash that contributes nothing new to the genre. But, believe it or not, it actually gets worse. As I mentioned, there's another version of this song, one that features Charlie Puth. This only further proves my point that the country music industry thinks so little of their female talent that they have to assign them a male pop chart chaperone. And a rather wimpy one at that. And so what does Charlie contribute to this remix version? Baby, I, I hope you work it out Forgiven just about Forget, let them take you on a first date again abso fucking lutely nothing As a matter of fact, the song now makes no sense at all. The second verse now comes from the perspective of a guy that's been cheated on. And he's hoping that the girl that was unfaithful meets someone else that will cheat on her. This completely changes the entire intent, tone, and mood of the song. I didn't really care for the original, but this remix is just insulting. It's a big middle finger to country music fans, to Gabby Barrett, and most importantly, my ears. And this hoedown ain't over yet. At number 10, it's Luke Bryan, One Margarita. One margarita, two margarita, three margarita shot. Don't worry about tomorrow, leave all your sorrow out here on the floating dock. When that sun lays down, we'll be on our way. One more barefoot round, one more last chance to say. Hey, senorita, don't you think we need a salt and a buffet song? One margarita, two margarita, three margarita, we'll be gone. Yeah, that's 
right, it's bro country icon and rejected Jim Henson redneck Muppet himself, Luke Bryan, back with another fun-filled, auto-tuned shit fest. Ah, but you see, the difference this time is that he's talking about drinking and, uh, bikinis. Oh, and of course, this line here. Ah, uh, hey there, senorita, why don't you go fetch me another drink and uh, shit-can this mariachi music and put on some Jimmy Buffett? Because you have to include a Buffett reference whenever you're doing a song about margaritas. Even Luke Bryan realizes this song isn't very good, and it should be noted that he didn't even write it. In an interview earlier this year with the Detroit News, he said, If you're a fan of mine and you don't like this song, don't write me off for the rest of your life. Wait till I put out something that's more what you want to hear from me. Translation? Yeah, I know this song's a turd, but stick with me and I'll eventually put out something that isn't a complete waste of your time. Uh, maybe. I'm not sure if I should admire his honesty or chastise him for not standing by his music, even if it is terrible. Number 9 is Drake, Toozy Slide. Black leather glove, no sequins. Buckles on the jacket, it's elite shit. Nike crossbody, got a piece in it. Gotta dance, but it's really on some street shit. I'ma show you how to get it. This certainly isn't the first time that Drake has made my list. Usually, I just criticize how dreadfully dull his latest so-called effort happens to be, then I move on and forget about him. But this song? No. It is not simply boring. In fact, to call this boring is like saying that the customer service at Comcast is unsatisfactory. This song is lifeless. It is audio ambient. A fucking funeral dirge. Those aren't exactly the kind of adjectives you want to hear describing a track that you hope becomes the next viral dance craze. And speaking of that dance, truly inspiring. Right foot up, left foot slide, left foot up, right foot slide, or, you know, basically just do whatever the hell you want. I don't know. So how this normally works is that an EDM or hip hop artist will release a track, then someone on TikTok does a stunt or a dance to that song, and then it goes viral. While Drake decided to skip the middleman in this process and pay someone to come up with the dance, that would be the choreographer 2Z, and then Drake just did the dance himself on TikTok the day the song was released. Now, if you don't feel like you've been sufficiently lulled into a coma just yet, there's more. Don't you wanna dance with me? No, I could dance like Michael Jackson. I could get you the pay. It's a thriller in a trap. Where we from? What the hell is going on in this song? Is Drake so bored with his own music that he's falling asleep in the middle of each word? Well, I guess that makes sense given how simplistic this backing track is. All I'm hearing is a droning synth pad with a weak Fruity Loops beat that prattles on for over four minutes? That's 80 to 90% longer than almost every song on the pop chart. My God, this is the Alice's Restaurant of Hip Hop. You can get anything you want at Alice's Restaurant. You can get anything you want at Alice's Restaurant. Number eight right. is Saweetie Tap In. Low waist, fat ass bitch, tap in. Tap, tap, tap in. Diamonds dancing on your neck, nigga, tap in. Tap, tap, tap in. Nigga, get rich, bitch, tap in. Tap, tap, tap in. MLB, I see gang, nigga, tap in. Tap, tap, tap in. Oof, da. You've got seven filthy words in the first eight lines of your song, dare, Saweetie. I think it's great that there are finally more female performers getting noticed in rap and hip hop. Now we just need to work on quality control. Based on these first eight lines, it seems that Saweetie isn't bringing anything innovative to the table. But let's go ahead and see if the verses offer up anything more substantive. Wrist on glitter, nice. waist on thinner. Nice. I'ma show you how to bag an eight-figure nigga. Face on zaddy, pockets on jigger. You better get the car to make it swipe like Tinder. Private villa in the fire chip killer. When he posts me, all the house gets sicker. But boy killer, I don't need fillers. Nope. Never been a lame, so the real bitches feel it. Zaddy on the FaceTime, you can never take mine. End up on a date line, uh, uh, uh. Rich with no day job. Put it 
in his mouth. All right, let's see what we've got here. So she evidently enjoys wearing jewelry. Also, she enjoys having a thin waistline. She's going to demonstrate the manner in which one would win the affections of an individual that has a net worth of between $10 million and $99,999,999. But this particular individual must be stylish and attractive on many levels. However, be prepared to make frequent use of your credit card with her. All right. She expresses a desire for luxury accommodations and high-end clothing. Saweetie is hoping that her new companion will make her peers envious. She's also letting you know that it would be inadvisable to engage in a confrontation with her as she possesses the skill set necessary to dispose of you in a discreet fashion. That's very interesting. She would like to be wealthy but without employment. And then she makes what appears to be a random noise or perhaps an ethnic slur. I'm not really sure. She has noticed that individuals with substantial wealth have expressed interest in performing oral sex on her. Sawidi says that she hails from the west coast of the United States, but then uses a geographic metaphor to yet again refer to oral sex. She says there are numerous individuals that would like to be with her intimately so that they may attain a higher social standing. And while she won't permit them to have intercourse, she will allow them the privilege of pleasuring her orally. In other words, buy me stuff, please me sexually, and don't piss me off because I can kill you. Hey, at least you've got the coveted Charlie Puth endorsement. I know that carries a lot of weight in the rap and hip-hop world. Also, I'm kind of confused about what she's saying here. Tap in. Tap, tap, tap in. Is it tap in or tap in? And if it is tap in, what does that even mean? I mean, based on this verse, I guess that means to tap into my finances? Yeah, I just don't understand. Number seven is Florida Georgia Line. I love my country. I love my country. I love my country. Six strings and fiddles and ski from Kentucky. We keep it funky. We like how it sounds. Monday to Sunday. Yeah, I love my country. Love a loud and proud. Rolling in the town. Hanging out the window like a blue tick hound. I ain't sorry. Ain't nothing to be sorry about. As much as it bothers me to have to do this, I actually have to defend this song just a little bit. Why? Because I've seen and heard a few ultra-hacky, wannabe music critics talk about how, in light of everything going on, a song about loving your country is tone-deaf. I might at least partially agree with that message if it applied here, but it absolutely does not. It's as if these lazy asses noticed that FGL put out a new song, saw the title was I Love My Country, and wrote a rant about it without even listening to one note. Here's one example of a person that doesn't get it. Many people definitely do not love this country right now, but Florida Georgia Line does. The pop duo's attempt at a unifying, patriotic anthem sounds inexplicably dated, not to mention they don't seem to have a foot to stand on. For a variety of reasons in 2020 alone, America remains one of the worst places to live right now, and Florida Georgia Line can't even sell you on a single reason as to why it's great. This right here is the equivalent of criticizing Donald Trump because his name begins with the letter Q. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of reasons to despise him, but that one isn't even factually accurate. Had you done your homework, you would know that this song is actually about their love of the country music genre and the stereotypically simplistic country lifestyle. You know, being a redneck, essentially. Notice this part. You see, pop, rock, and rap are genres of music. Living fast and four-lane roads are associated with the city. FGL here says that those things are all well and good, but they prefer their country lifestyle as well as the music, and they want that music to be played loud. All right, now that we've gotten that out of the way, what's actually so bad about this song? Well, other than the fact that it's a cliche-riddled, stereotypical pander fest, a lot. I've talked about this before, but I make fun of pop, rap, and hip-hop artists for how they flaunt their lavish lifestyles. But shallow as it may be, at least it's fairly honest. This song, however, is like so many others in the country genre that are just so disingenuous. 
Well, shoot, I like sitting on my porch next to my worn-out screen door that's hanging off to one hinge, eating off a styrofoam plate, barbecuing, fishing, and drinking beer out the can. These two guys of Florida Georgia Line are each worth $25 million. Stop pretending that you're some down-home, Joe Six-Pack, backwoods, blue-collar hick. Also, for a chorus that talks about six strings and fiddles, this song certainly lacks both of those. It's basically a pop rock song with a tiny bit of twang thrown in. The kind of manufactured, cookie-cutter music that make Florida Georgia Line sound like the Nickelback of country. Hell, even Nickelback didn't abuse autotune as much as these guys do. And just like some of the other country songs on my list, what's with this trend of name-dropping classic country performers? You do realize that if someone goes and listens to George Strait, they're going to realize how uninspired most modern country has become, right? At number six, it's Cardi B featuring Megan the Stallion, WAP. I said certified free, seven days a week, wet ass pussy, make that pullout game weak. So I have a general rule against putting novelty songs on my worst song list. And when this was first released and I heard its over the top lyrics and just how absurd it sounded, well, that's exactly what I thought it was. To me, this was basically in the same category as a Weird Al or Disco Duck by Rick Dees or even Rappin' Rodney. I can't take it no more. I'm getting too old. No respect. No respect. I called suicide prevention. They put me on hold. No respect. No respect. Yes, that's right. I put WAP here into the same classification as a cringy 80s rap song from a 61-year-old comedian not to be taken seriously and ultimately forgotten in a week. Okay, but here's the problem. I was completely wrong. Everybody did take it seriously, from podcasters to celebrities and especially other musicians. Don't get me wrong, I love seeing these ultra-conservative white dudes like Ben Shapiro and Tucker Carlson get completely bent out of shape about a song. In fact, Tucker may have had the single most ironic and unintentionally self-aware line of the century when discussing this tune when he said, quote, People are getting rich pushing this crap on the country and they should be ashamed of themselves, but they're not ashamed of themselves. In any event, since everyone else is taking this song so seriously, let's see what all the hype is about. I don't know if I just hate sampling or can't find any current music that does it well. In this case, you have the song Whores in This House with that one line repeated throughout. It's a pretty obnoxious, albeit obscure sample. The only reason I even knew it existed in the first place was because I heard it on the Howard Stern Show back in the 90s. Also, I've talked about this with regard to other artists over the years, but using ostentatious and exaggerated metaphors to describe your lady bits is not in the least bit sexy. Saying it's wet is fine, but saying that I'll require a mop and bucket for your box makes me think that you need to schedule a visit to a gynecologist. And here's exhibit A as to why I thought this was just a novelty hit. It's pretty adolescent. <laughs> I'll park my truck in your garage. <laughs> Look, I need a hard hit. I need a deep stroke. I need a henny drink. I need a weed smoke. Not a garden snake. I need a king cobra with a hook in it. Hope it lead over. Well, of course, the song isn't completely childish. Cardi B and Megan are apparently seeking a man with significant endurance sexually, but also a man that enjoys cannabis. Obviously, she wants a well endowed guy. That's nothing new for a Cardi B song. But what the fuck is she talking about here? A king cobra with a hook in it? Hope it lean over? I guess you're looking for a man with an equally odd medical condition to go along with your mop and bucket labia. In total, the song has four verses and the hook is only repeated a couple of times throughout. Aside from that whores in this house sample, the track isn't actually repetitive at all, which is kind of a welcome change. At face value, this song is just a string of sexual cliches underscored by adolescent humor. So long as it isn't taken seriously, there shouldn't be a problem. Unfortunately, the song is intended to be taken seriously, at least according to Cardi B. She's stated repeatedly that WAP is about women's empowerment. 
Ah, come on. It's a fucking song describing in graphic detail the moisture levels of your vagina and the desire to have a well-endowed, curved cock slamming into it. It's not about bridging the gender pay gap or providing equal educational and employment opportunities to females. You know, real social change and empowerment. It's a song with a line that literally says, I don't want to spit, I want to gulp. And just to be clear, I'm not a moralist. I'm not bothered by this song because it's dirty and vulgar. But presenting this as some kind of empowerment anthem is like going to an Applebee's, getting served a cow turd between two pieces of bread, and having them tell you that it's an Angus beef burger. And yeah, I know it's Applebee's. I know it's mediocre going into it. But don't try to lie about what you're giving me. That's all I ask. At number five, it's Ariana Grande, Positions. Heaven, send you to me. So, why am I hearing crickets in this song? Boy, I'm trying to meet your mama on Sunday To make a lot of love on Monday uh, Never need no, no one else, babe Cause I'll be Oh man, just about the time I think I've heard every kind of irritating sound effect or production element in music. Leave it to some asshole producer to come along and raise the bar on audio torture. I even went ahead and checked out the backing track to see if I was hearing things. Goddamn crickets run basically the entire length of the track. There may be some deeply prophetic or inspiring lyrics to this song. I mean, it's Ariana Grande, so I doubt that highly. But who the fuck would know it? I saw some fan speculation that the crickets were Ariana's way of paying tribute to her deceased ex-boyfriend, Mac Miller. Whether that's accurate or not is irrelevant. Annoying production is annoying production, regardless of its intent. At number four, it's Megan the Stallion featuring Beyonce, Savage. This is another hit from this year that had two versions. But in this case, the version featuring Beyonce is exponentially worse than Megan's solo track. There are a number of reasons I chose this rendition of the song. The most obvious of which being Beyonce trying to sound like a badass. Accidental comedy is probably not what this duo is striving for. But it gets more cringy. Hips tick tock when I dance. dance. On that demon time, she might start her only fans. Only fans. Big B and that B stand for bands. If you want to see some real ass, baby, here's your chance. Don't you hate it when mom still tries to sound like she's with it? Oh, I know all you kids are on TikTok now, so I'll mention that. Beyonce also references OnlyFans, which is kind of like Patreon, but with naked women. And of course, it wouldn't be hip-hop without mentioning how much money you have. And that's at least one thing we know Beyonce has in abundance. And then we have Megan the Stallion's portion of the song. I'm a savage, yeah. Classy, bougie, ratchet, yeah. Sassy, moody, nasty, yeah. Hacking, stupid, what's happening? Have you ever met that one person that gives themselves a nickname? Yeah, nice to meet you, bro. Just call me Cobra. Giving yourself a nickname or assigning a specific term to your mental or physical prowess is embarrassing. Now, if someone else gives you a nickname or refers to you as a savage, well, I guess I could go along with it. But otherwise, you kind of have to earn that title. Musically speaking, this has, what, two notes and a beat that's completely indistinguishable from anything else in the genre. Oh, and that reminds me, uh, the other big reason that the Beyonce remix is on my list instead of the Megan solo version is because this is over four minutes long. Yeah, that's a bit more savage than I can handle. Number three is J.P. Sachs featuring Julia Michaels, If the World Was Ending. I was distracted and in traffic I didn't feel it when the earthquake happened But it really got me thinking Were you out drinking? Were you in the living room chilling Watching television? It's been a year now Think I figured out how How to let you go and let communication die out If the World Was Ending was released toward the end of 2019 And it was on pace to be a middling hit That was relatively forgettable Ah, but as luck would have it A global pandemic erupted and so a depressing, apocalyptic-themed snoozer like this rode the wave of chaos that was 2020 and spent seven months on the Billboard Hot 100. 
Now, I'm sure some of you think I put this song on the list because it's a slow song and it's boring, but actually, that's the least of its problems. No, this track is here because it suffers from the deadly one two combination of bad songwriting and even worse vocals. Oh, and add in the cherry on top of being a jump off the bridge level of depressing during the worst year of anyone's lifetime, and you've got quite a shitstorm. So let's dive in and take a look at the songwriting first. But if the world was ending, you'd come over, right? You'd come over and you'd stay the night. Would you love me for the hell of it? All our fears would be irrelevant. If the world was ending, you'd come over, right? The sky'd be falling and I'd hold you tight. And there wouldn't be a reason why. We would even have to say goodbye. If the world was ending, you'd come over, right? Right? The story here is that following a minor earthquake, the guy in this song decides to call up an ex-girlfriend that he hasn't spoken to in at least a year. Yeah, apparently a 4.7 on the Richter scale is enough to trigger an existential crisis, one in which the only possible solution is to go back to the relationship that both parties admit was a total failure the first time. I've seen a number of people post this song on social media describing it as sweet and romantic. Even J.P. Sachs says there's a romantic fantasy here. Maybe I don't understand romance, or maybe the songwriting is fucking abysmal. Julia, you know that earthquake that I didn't even feel from the other night? Well, it kind of got me thinking about the possibility of Earth being completely destroyed and all life as we know it coming to an end. So, having said that, like, hey, you'll come over and fuck my brains out, right? Oh my god, JP, yes, I was thinking the very same thing. Like, if the world was to explode, even though we hated each other, like, we should totally get it on. When I really think about it, I can get past the woefully melancholy nature of this song. I can even overlook the ridiculous premise and bad writing. But what I can't forgive are the vocals of Julia Michaels. I tried to imagine your reaction. It didn't scare me when the earthquake happened. But it really got me thinking. The night we went drinking. Stumbled in the house and didn't make it past the kitchen. Oh, it's been a year now. I think I figured out how. How to think about you without it ripping my heart out. I know I've said this before, but just because you're an accomplished writer of hit songs doesn't mean you have the ability to sing them. Her range is terrible, she's usually flat, and her vocal control, well, it's practically non-existent. So she is definitely the weaker vocalist on this song. But that's not to say that J.P. Sachs is anything special. He kind of reminds me of a congested Adam Levine, only tuned about an octave lower. And then there's the harmonies between these two, and they just sound awkward and grating at times. Even 2020 didn't deserve a song like this. Number two is Justin Bieber, Yummy. Yeah, you got that yummy, yum, that yummy, yum, that yummy, yummy. Yeah, you got that yummy, yum, that yummy, yum, that yummy, yummy. Okay, so I'm not sure what I find more disturbing here. The fact that a 26-year-old man says yummy, yummy, or the use of such a childish term in relation to anything sexual. I've never been a big fan of the food sex metaphors in music, but the juvenile presentation of this song makes me think that Chris Hansen is going to walk in at any moment and tell me to take a seat. And yeah, we get it. You're married, but I really don't need to hear about the taste of Haley's vagina, especially when described like that. But this song has other awkward parts as well. 50-50, love the way you split it. On a rack, so spin it, babe. Light a match, get lit it, babe. The jet set, watch the sunset, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Aw, isn't that adorable? Justin's trying to sound all urban. You know, the whitest guy from the whitest part of the whitest country is going to drop a hundred racks line on us, and we're supposed to take that seriously? Despite the fact that the very next line he says, light a match and get litty? What are you talking about? And then the cringe factor is turned all the way up for this. I don't think there's anything I've heard in music this year that's more grotesque than Bieber describing his climax. As disgraceful as this song is lyrically and vocally, it's almost as awful musically. 
Even by pop standards, the arrangement of this track is lazy as fuck. You get two chords repeated throughout, G minor 7 and A minor 7. Oh yeah, there's also a C chord in there, but that's the line where JB describes his money shot, so I kind of forgot about it. Now, there are two notable milestones with this song. Number one, it's the first time that Justin Bieber has appeared on my worst song list. But even more impressive, it's the first artist I've talked about here that's openly and completely shamelessly told his fans to artificially inflate the streaming numbers for his track in the hopes of fraudulently pushing it to number one. But even though you tried to game the system, it failed. This song only made it to number two on the Billboard Hot 100 and then dropped off very quickly thereafter. So what's the big lesson here? Well, I don't know, I guess uh, cheaters almost win? And now, before I get to the worst song of the year, it's time for my dishonorable mentions. The songs that were notably bad, but I just couldn't find any room for them on my list. For instance, here's the worst cover of 2020. It's Rit Momney, Put Your Records On. Gotta love those indie artists. It's as if this guy sat down and said, hmm, what marginally successful hit from the mid-2000s can I turn into my personal toilet? Clearly, people were so desperate for entertainment this year that this auto-tuned falsetto fecal fest actually charted on the Hot 100. And speaking of excrement... Fuck you and you and you I hate your friends and they hate me too I'm through well, girl broke up with me. Well, I'm throwing a tantrum. You probably thought that the emo genre had died off in 2007. Well, clearly not. This is actually what Matthew Tyler Musto, Mr. Black Bear himself, said regarding what this song is about. Quote, I'm standing on top of this couch at the club. I'm like, fuck you to everybody. They're like, I hate you, whatever. It's a whole thing. It's a big fuck you fest. A big dick-sized judging contest almost. I fall victim to that. Also, it's almost like when you're in a relationship and the other person is like, I hate your friends. It's okay. I hate them too. It's almost my relationship with society in a way. Not society even, just culture in a way. Where it's like, I need you culture. You know what I mean? I need you, but at the same time, it's fuck you. I know that sounds like the ramblings of some teenage manifesto, but that guy is 30 years old. Well, you did it, Black Bear. I had prepared other things to say about this song, but now my brain hurts, so let's just move on. Okay, so you may have noticed that there was quite a bit more country music on my list this year. And there actually could have been even more because of crap like this. It's Riley Green, I Wish Grandpa's Never Died. And I wish even cars had truck beds. And every road was named Copperhead. And coolers never run out of cold blood life. And I wish high school home teams never lost. And back road drinking kids never got caught. And I wish the price of gas was low and cotton was high. I wish honky tonks didn't have no clothes in town. And I wish grandpa's never died. Well, hot damn, we hit a big old vein of country cliches. You doggies. On top of my usual complaints about country music, this song just makes no sense. Why would you wish cars had truck beds? If you want a truck, just buy a goddamn truck. Why impose your less fuel efficient vehicle design on everyone else? And if every road was named Copperhead, wouldn't that be confusing? All right, so let me give you directions to my house, man. Uh, first, you're going to go straight on Copperhead. You'll make a left onto Copperhead, right onto Copperhead, straight down Copperhead, past the Safeway. Then you'll make a left onto Copperhead. You'll go straight for quite a while. Then you'll come to this little road called Copperhead, all right? You'll turn there, and my house will be the fourth one on the right. You can't miss it. You guys do know that there are other brands of beer than Bud Light, correct? If high school home teams never lost, then what would be the point of playing the game? I'm pretty sure Mothers Against Drunk Driving would not be a fan of this line. 
And why wouldn't you want the price of gas and cotton to be low? I mean, doesn't the basic law of supply and demand as well as market speculation drive these prices anyway? And why would you wish grandfathers had immortality but not grandmothers? What about the ramifications on Social Security? And can you imagine the line at Luby's Cafeteria by 3 p.m.? Yeah, this song is fucking stupid. And now for some breaking news. Billie Eilish is still boring. Cause I, I'm in love with my Despite what you might think, I'm not a Billie Eilish hater. In fact, I think she has a beautiful voice. Of course, it's being totally squandered on garbage like this. It may also help if they set the tempo to something higher than continental drift. Next up, it's Doja Cat, boss bitch. Yeah, I'm not so sure I can accept you as a boss bitch when just a couple of years ago you gave us this. Bitch, I'm a cow. Bitch, I'm a cow. I'm not a cat. I don't say now. Well, congratulations on being elevated above meme status, but as far as I'm concerned, you're always going to be the person that did Bitch, I'm a cow and nothing more. And here's the final dishonorable mention, and I wouldn't be upset if it was the final time we ever heard from these guys again. It's AJR Bang. I get up, I get down, and I'm jumping around in the rumpus and rock. Get so comfortable now. Been a hell of a ride, but I'm thinking it's time to grow. Are they trying to be electropop or maybe EDM? Maybe alternative rock? Nah, fuck it. Let's just be everything at once and throw in a bunch of random samples. Here we go. So pitch your best face on everybody. Pretend you know this song. Everybody come hang. Let's go out with some bang. And I know I'm bothered by this part more than most, but there's just no excuse for poor production or bad audio quality in modern music. I mean, feel free to write as many terrible songs as you want, and I'm sure you will. But just don't make them sound like they're recorded on some 50-year-old rusted analog equipment. Although if you did do that, at least I could understand why the audio sounds completely overmodulated. Metronome. I'm pretty sure I understand AJR's music philosophy, though. We'll just use a bunch of random sounds to cover up for the piss-poor songwriting and the fact that we only know, like, two notes on the piano. And now, here it is, the worst song of 2020. It's Nicki Minaj, Yikes. Don't ever fucking play with me. Y'all niggas know, y'all bitches know I'm the fucking queen. You hoe bitches know, you dirty bum bitches know. I can't think of a song that epitomizes 2020 more than this. Just 11 seconds in, and already it's a global catastrophe. Let's see here. She's already dropped in the N-word once. She's cursed several times. Reminded us that she's the queen, which is laughable for many reasons, but also kind of sad that someone well past their expiration date in the industry has absolutely no self-awareness. She says dirty bum bitches, which is new, I guess. Oh, and then there's this irritating growly sort of noise. So, yeah, Nikki hitting all the classic highlights right out of the gate. Woke up the price of coke up. I just hit them with the low cut and call my folks up. Somebody about to get poked up. Go call a tow truck. All that talking out your neck might just get your throat cut. Remember when Nikki said she was retiring? Well, I guess she felt it necessary to come back and drop this masterpiece on us. Because it sounds so much different from everything else she's been puking out for the last decade. Here's your obligatory drug reference. Then she says she's going to slash your tires. And if you keep talking, she's going to cut your throat. Now, after this, I do have to say the song does go in a rather unanticipated direction. So it's pretty rare for me to be surprised by anything in music. But this one was definitely a curveball. 
So Nikki refers to bitches as Rosa Parks. And then she tells them to get your ass up, much like Rosa Parks was told to go to the back of the bus. Who in the fuck did you write this song with, Jeff Sessions? Look, I get that Nicki Minaj is a performer and that her popularity isn't even close to what it once was. And so I guess she feels like she has to be as outrageous as possible because she's too creatively bankrupt to do it any other way. But this is just racist, ignorant bullshit. And as if that wasn't enough, this song was released during Black History Month and three days after Rosa Parks' birthday. TMZ had reported that Nikki apologized for the timing of this song, but then when Nikki found out about the report regarding her alleged apology, she took to social media and said, nah, never happened, I never apologized, and gave a big apathetic fuck you. I just think it's pathetic that while Nicki Minaj leads a lavish lifestyle, she defecates all over the legacy of a civil rights trailblazer. Because had it not been for the bravery of people like Rosa Parks, the only work Nicki would be doing in a recording studio would be cleaning it. Anyway, as if this song can't get any more rancid, there's this verse. Yikes, I play tag and you it for life. Yikes, you a clown, you do it for likes. Yikes, yes it's tight, but it doesn't bite. Rip it right, he be like. Ah good, another song where Nicki describes her vag and how it's tight and it doesn't bite? Yeah, let's just go fly a kite. I just might. Let's do it tonight. That's out of sight. As I sit here and look at it now, I'm actually glad Nicki Minaj came out of retirement. Because if there's one thing this genre needs, it's more songs about sex, violence, and murder. Plus, we need someone to put those pesky civil rights advocates in their place. Well, I guess you're right, Nicki. You still are the queen. The queen of the worst songs from the worst year in several generations. And there you have it, the 20 worst songs of 2020. Did you agree with my list? Did I miss something? Well, feel free to comment, leave your feedback, and if you enjoyed this video, and you know what, even if you didn't, be sure to subscribe, like, share, and click that notification bell so that whenever I post a brand new video, you'll get the alert. And if you'd like to continue to support my work, check me out on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash michaelgroff. Thank you so much for watching. I know it can be tough to sit through some of these bad songs sometimes, but I really do appreciate it. You guys be safe out there. We'll see you again real soon.